Now, it was Diego who, Diego who described a set uh, of the magic flute in Budapest uh -huh. that you did with Laszlo Martin. Yeah. And he described the set as being a chandelier, a bed, uh, a carpet, yeah. uh, some bits of walls or something, and that because it was a dream, things began to move and change and perspectives would change. Well, it was actually, it wasn't, it was, it was just a kid's room um, with a kind of a light and a thing and then a door. And in fact, what happened is it sort of, it started, the, the bits of the room started to kind of change. And so you had, you were seeing, so things, people came through things and that they wouldn't normally come through because they were in different positions. So you were coming and this you is know, dusting off an older piece of work to give it its shine back? Um, yeah, in that, in that sense, it's, it's a very, that's complicated because Magic Flute is, is more trying to understand what the piece is about because it's a very <laughs> difficult, I think it's a really difficult piece to, um, and there's a kind of level of magic that, that rests inside the piece, so it was giving it a kind of, um, some way of lifting it off into a magical world um, and also uh, trying to make sense of the complicated levels that are in the piece because you know it's not just magic there's another there's something else that's going on in the magic flute um, so yeah that was yeah trying to yeah because you know in some in some sense, sometimes you come up, come across a criticism where people say, "Well, why didn't you just set it in the in the thing with a thing, and it's it'd be in a room with a forest and a thing?" And you know, sometimes it is appropriate to follow the stage directions and do and do it in the thing. But you know, some of these pieces are written in the 19th century for painted scenery, and the, and the audience's relationship with painted scenery was completely different than. Mm -hmm. Our relationship to the stage now, we demand, we would demand something on a whole other level from our performers than what audiences in the 19th century do. We demand a different thing from scenery that people in the 19th century demanded from scenery. I mean, such as know, what, are, what are our different demands of scenery? Well, I mean, you know, for example, mid 19th century, these sets were, were lit by gaslight. And so you know, they were seen in this kind of vague, kind of warm um, light. The, there was no context of television or... So, you know, people's visual terms of reference were paintings. And these were paintings on stage. I mean, these were three-dimensional paintings. So you have to kind of put yourself... You know, I can't do that, but I mean, I, you know, you can try to put yourself in a kind of... You know, in a, in, a, in a 19th century audience, you're looking at beautiful three-dimensional 19th century paintings of forests and castles, and you know, so they were appreciated on a completely different level as, as almost live paintings. Um, whereas now we, we don't have that language. People don't share that language like they did in the 19th century. Um, so, you know, and there was a, a there was a, you know, and you, and you, when you look at the beautiful models of, that were, you know, made in the 19th century and you look at the, um, the drawings of the maquettes and the, for, for the painted scenery, you know, they were incredible things, you know, and, 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 and perspective and which was, you know, for some audience members, a completely new thing. It was a very, it sort of, a, it was a, it was a, a meeting of science and art. You know, you saw this incredible perspective going back in the 18th century for miles. I mean, it was fantastic and exciting. But our relationship to painted scenery is completely different. We don't see it as trees or as a painting. We see it as like painted scenery. So it feels a little dusty and, you know, it can be incredibly beautiful. Um, it can be beautifully done and people still do very beautiful scene painting on stage, but we see it within a kind of context of coming from a different time. Um, so you can't actually set these things as they're, you know, some of these things as they were written because we're a different time. And that's Do you what think the, some designers are using projections in high tech and computers as a way to parallel, you know, the ah, it's seeing perspective in painting scenery and oh my god, I went to the theater and I saw for miles. 
now some designers are trying to evoke the same awe. Oh my gosh, there was computers and things were moving and actors were moving and sets were doing things yeah. to kind of reproduce that kind of visual use. Yeah. 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 And I'm very interested in everything, you know, using all sorts of different tools that are available to us. I mean, you know, that's one of the interesting areas of exploration I think that Complicite is doing is they're trying to understand this new medium and how to integrate that within the telling of stories. Um, what's the level of it, how it can be used. And so, you know, there's, it can be successful, it can be not so successful. So you want to try to take the um, medium and begin to understand what sort of voice it has and how powerful it is and how to play it with other voices and and it's like everything you have to you have to have it in the rehearsal room really to begin to discover what it does um, so there are and there are times where I think it's I've been you know the collaboration has been very successful and then there are times where I think you know we failed I mean there's certain things about video that you have to it's very, it's very difficult because also our relation to it as an audience is, you know, we watch things on television. So we have this, um, we're very, it's almost like we're easily bored by, by, by video, video imagery. Um, and I'm not sure. It's kind of new kind of promiscuity. I mean, yeah. such fantastic visual imagery is thrown at us in, either in a commercial or a quick newscast and I want a better and better picture of that meltdown in that reactor in Tokyo or I'm not even going to watch the news unless you give me a fabulous picture of someone really crying and right. it's become a very kind of promiscuous uh, I need that visual feed all the time better and better faster and faster uh -huh. uh, and if you're a designer then yeah. to create these visual worlds and your audience have walked in from seeing extraordinary footage on the local news yeah. Uh, you know, and extraordinary, you know, cell phone footage brought in from Libya about the man, the way the, you know, the AK-47 just mowed down that person. Mm. How do you address that world that is now so visually overloaded with sort mm. of caffeine and sugar of, of visualness, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I mean, audiences are incredibly sophisticated visually now. And so you... And I think jaded or sophisticated. Sophisticated, and I think there's something really interesting about how we relate to media, and it would be silly to ignore it. I mean, you know, you can't do a play now set in our time without people talking on cell phones, you know. And what is that form of communication? Um, how do people relate to each other on cell phones? You know, that's an interesting area of exploration. I think it's our job as the theater, because I still think that theater plays an important role in society where you're putting things on the stage for people to witness. And so it allows you to kind of step outside of yourself because they're real people on stage, but they're doing these things, doing high tech things like talking on cell phones. And what is the kind of communication? What, how does it affect people? You know, I think it, one of the things about the stage is it allows people the ability to really observe things very carefully and and allows you to have a kind of the actor and the all of the people involved in the production to regulate sort of regulate the pace in a slightly different way and it has a different feeling than when you're watching something on television because it's so intentional um, a live performance so you know when somebody's moving incredibly slowly it places a very um, it's, it, it, it places in a very specific context, so you see it in a different way, I think, uh, than because you're seeing it outside of, you're seeing it, a piece of reality because it's happening before you at that very time, but it's being, it's being taken out of its sort of reality and, and watched by the person on stage. So I do think it's really interesting to begin to understand all of the media and to use it and to try to... Uh, integrate it I, I think it's a mistake to use it as something as a gimmick it's a personal as a personal 
you know, I think it's a mistake to use it as a substitute for something else. So it's a substitute for 19th century scenery. That doesn't really mean it's an idea. But, you know, as a kind of um, something that is, um, that can inform the story in some way, I think it's really interesting to begin to understand how to use that. I mean, you know, I mean, and it can be, it doesn't have to be just video, it's light, it's electricity, it's all sorts of things that can tell sense of place, sense of story, and give an emotion, and um, and you only begin to understand that until you begin to play with those things, and, um, you know, and you make lots of mistakes, because sometimes they're kind of messy. Um, and in fact, video, for example, is something really interesting, even five years ago. It was quite a clumsy medium, and now it's really fluid. So again, you can kind of change things very quickly. Um, it's almost—it's sort of catching up to lighting in the sense that, you know, a video designer can download something off the internet and put it on stage immediately. You can see how that's going to work with things. Um, you know, uh, there was a moment when we were working on. So here's a whole mixture of collaborative, sort of trying to discover something in. I was working on Mnemonic, which was a production I did with Complicité, and there's, you know, it's always very chaotic in their working process because they're writing the piece at the same time as I, I explained before, designing the piece, and, you know, there was a moment where there was a bed on stage, and and I sort of said, well, you know, why, why don't we just put a video projector in the bed? Because maybe that's interesting. Just to play with, let's see what happens. So we did, we put the video projector in the bed, and never. Everybody was saying, no, it's not a good idea because where's the cable going to go and what are we going to do with the cable? And, and I said, well, you know, we should just you know, try it. Let's put the thing because it might be nice, it might be fun to try. And we did. And but then it was quite interesting. And this was also kind of, I guess this was 10 years ago. Um, so again, that sort of, you know, the projector is like this big that you have to put in the bed. Whereas nectars that are, you know, they're this big, they're incredible, and they do, you know, beautiful. Um, and then out of that came this really very beautiful moment in the piece where Virgil, the character, has a phone call from his girlfriend who's gone traveling far away. And he's in his bed, and she's on her cell phone, and she calls him, and her image comes up on, her, it's on his chest. And it's very, very beautiful <coughs> because he... He's talking to her, she's being filmed, sort of on the side, and it was played by Catherine Cartlidge, who's, um, anyway, she was brilliant, and she's being filmed live on the phone, he gets the thing here, and they're separated, and so you had this great, it was wonderful, a sort of incredible sense of separation, and you felt this kind of, you know, his one, you know, it just it was beautiful, and, um, and then at some moment he kind of, wipes his chest and the, her face goes away. So, and, and for me, that's uh, where, you know, where video imagery becomes, starts to become really interesting because you're seeing it all there, but it tells you another level, which is rather beautiful. And that came, you know, out of just a little, you know, exp of having the thing and experimenting. It's very hard to place it <coughs> on top of the production. And, but, you know, you, but it was in the days, and the only th the only way you could get rid of the image was he had to kind of like kick the bed sheet over the thing, so that it would cut the image out. Otherwise, you had this weird. 